Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be here on this week, and um, we need your presence, Lord. We need to uh, recognize, we need to come apart, we need to have the time, this change of circumstances, and a time of reflection upon the condition of our own heart. We just ask, Lord, that uh, as we open your word, that you will, it will bring a conviction to us, that we will see our sins clearly, and that we will also see your power and your love and your compassion that can transform us, that can change us, that can revive us, uh, and that we can not just do this for ourselves, Lord, that we can be a witness, a living testimony, Amen. that people will be drawn to you through the change that has happened in our lives. And be with me as I speak. Um, help me to communicate the things that you would have me communicate and have your Holy Spirit interpret. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sure, why I did that? Okay. There you go. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm thankful that I can be here presenting this study. And there's so many things that we have studied, all of us individually over the last uh, time that we've had this camp meeting. And uh, this is probably the least uh, uh, amount of study I've, I've spent on something that I'm going to pre present, but it's something that uh, I felt compelled to present. And one of the things is, you know, I've, I study a lot of different things. I'm not a guy who just concentrates on one thing. But, uh, And so many things that I tend to concentrate on are answering questions, you know, questions I have. And I was led to this study. Uh, I read a book, or at least uh, part of the book that I could find online by Heidi Hikes called Satan's Counterfeit Prophecy, which is on Josiah Litch's prophecy. And so from there, I began this study. And I hope that it's going to be helpful to you. But I just want to read uh, first, before I get into this study, an important statement. And this is from Christ's Object Lessons, page 128. In every, every age, there is a new development of truth. A message of God to the people of that generation. The old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of the old. Actually, I'm supposed to have this thing show up here. Here we go. Yes, there it is. Um, but an unfolding of it, it is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at Moses and all the prophets and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, Luke 24, 27. But, it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him it loses its vital power 
and becomes but a lifeless form. Mm -hmm. Now the thing is we can often see this in other people. We can read Heidi Hike's book and we can recognize that he doesn't really possess the old, that's why he doesn't understand the new. But for us personally, do we understand the old? And so I always tend to go back to basics. You know, and so some of this, you know, is, is a very basic thing. I'm going to be doing a presentation on the seven trumpets in three lectures. And originally I just wanted to focus on the first, second, and third woe. But as I began to study these things, God led me back to try to understand the whole of the seven trumpets altogether. And so this first lecture is somewhat of an introduction to the trumpets. I'm not going to do it, a complete study on the trumpets. I would need two lectures every day for a week, right? They didn't give me that much time, so I can't do that. But you need to study anyway. And I know there's so many things that are drawing our attention in this message to study, but we need to understand the old truths. And I know when I first heard of this message, uh, the first person I ever watched was uh, Manjit uh, Bayant. And he was, all I know is if something on Islam, and he was confirming the pioneer understanding of the trumpets. So I thought, well, that's good. He understands the pioneer understanding. You know, he's, he's not off in some new futuristic view. But within Adventism, there's all kinds of views that are happening. And because they don't understand the old, they're not going to be able to receive the new. You know, if you go into the area of, let's say, like the daily, and you start explaining uh, the 2520 for uh, Israel, northern Israel, and how it's two 1260s, and there's 1260 years for paganism and 1260 years for papalism, and somebody doesn't believe in the tr correct view of the daily, they're not going to understand what you're talking about. Right? So we need to understand these things. We need to be understanding the old so that we can understand the unfolding of the new. Now, Ellen White, in uh, regards to this prophecy, and what we're dealing with here is uh, the prophecy of the second woe right now. So I'm not going to start right at the beginning with the trumpets. I'm going to kind of go to the end and then go back to the beginning. But um, Ellen White makes this statement in The Great Controversy. And she says, in the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the second advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9 predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown in AD 1840, sometime in the month of August. And only a few days previous to its accomplishment, he wrote, allowing the first period, 150 years, to have been exactly fulfilled before Diakosis ascended the throne by permission of the Turks, and that the 391 years, 15 days, commenced at the close of the first period, it will end on the 11th of August, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may, may be expected to be broken, and this, I believe, will be found to be the case. And that's Josiah Litch in Signs of the Times, an expositor of prophecy, August 1st, 1840. So you can see that's before all August 11th that he published that statement. Now, of course, we understand August 11th, 1840 in this message. But do we really understand the basis for it? And part of it is not just that we can establish August 11th, 1840, but how we establish it is very important. And when you study the trumpets, we, we get a really good grasp of the principles of prophetic interpretation that is the foundation of our method, message. So obviously, there's lots of things we could study to do that. But the trumpets, when I studied it in the past, I had a mixture of... Uh, methodologies that I was using. And I know, you know, I followed a bit Ty Gibson and James Rafferty in my early years as an Adventist, and they would have the seven trumpets start in the time of Christ as they were all periods of history. But if you look at uh, Uriah Smith's uh, thoughts on, on the Revelation, he shows that the first four trumpets are basically events, and some of them are contemporaneous. They happen at the same time. So it's, they're not successive events like, the, fir, like the, the churches and the seals, right? So that's an important point to understand. Um, now, just one little thing about this quote, and I know this is kind of an aside, and you know, I probably shouldn't do it. It's in my notes, but I just want to draw attention to this, this 
this quote in Josiah Litch, because you will find this, one of the criticisms that people have regarding Josiah Litch is he mentions a guy named Diakoses, which of course is Constantine the 11th that he's talking about, but that title is never used for Constantine the 11th. And I actually found the book that Josiah Litch researched from, which is Hawkins' uh, History of the Turkish or Ottoman Empire, and I have references there, and I'm just going to go here. This is actually the quote from the book, and you can see, uh, this is actually Josiah Litch, pardon me, and you can see up there he talks about Constantine Diakoses, and if you look at the original, it's Constantine Dracoses. And it's a typo that has survived in Adventism. Where the typo originated, I don't know. It could have been that the source that uh, Josiah Litch used had a typo in it, and he just perpetuated a typo. That would be the most likely thing, that he didn't actually have the book, he, or he maybe had a copy of the book with a typo in it. It's, it's possible. But anyway, if you ever get confused, if you ever have somebody attacking Josiah Litch based upon that, Ellen White quotes Josiah Litch with the error, with the typo but she quotes him correctly. She didn't correct something that was not found until about a month ago. So nobody knew who Diakosi was until a month ago when I searched up the book. I could find nobody on the internet who knew that that was an error. So one of the things in studying, you can find things like that, that personally for you, for me it's very powerful, but personally for you, if you find things, correct errors, you know you're on the right track in your study. Okay, so I know that's not a major point, but I, I thought, for me, it's interesting. You're saying they're the same, Dracoses and Diakoses? Diakoses is, is a typo. Yeah, it's the R should be... Or the the e, e should be an R. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I have, I have the footnote, and I have both quotes, and you can see uh, where, the, where the mistake happened. Um, now, what I want to bring out here in, in looking at this is... There is a statement in Spirit of Prophecy that is constantly misinterpreted. And this is the statement uh, which I have uh, here on two slides. And this is taken from, and I guess I need to flip my page here. There it is. Just seeing if it's in my notes here. Oh, here it is. Yes, it's third selected messages. Now, there's a statement that people use, and they put the trumpets in the future. And back in the upper room Bible studies, you know, 27, 30 years ago, um, when we were studying Revelation, our Bible study group, there were people there wanting to put the trumpets in the future. And the statement they used was this, trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded, vial after vial poured out, one after another upon the inhabitants of the earth. And I knew that the trumpets were not future. I don't know how I knew it. But to me it just didn't make sense that they were future. Um, now the trumpets, what are trumpets for? Sound of war and sound of warning. They're warning of coming events, usually a battle. And if you read this whole statement, so here's the whole statement. The agency of the Holy Spirit is to combine with human effort and all heaven is engaged in the work of preparing a people to stand in these last days. The end is near and we want to keep the future world in view. In this last conflict, the captain of the Lord's host is leading on the armies of heaven and mingling in the ranks and fighting our battles for us. So what is this language? This is battle language, right? We shall have apostasies, we, shall, we will expect them, right? She then goes on in the next paragraph, the angel, the mighty angel from heaven is to lighten the earth with his glory, Revelation 18 verse 1, while he cries mightily with a loud voice, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. So we are coming to that time or we're in that time now where that's, that's, you know, we're in the process of that fulfillment of that prophecy. We will lose faith and courage in the conflict if we were not sustained by the power of God. 
Every form of evil is to spring into intense activity. Evil angels unite their powers with evil men, and as they have been in constant conflict and attain an experience in the best modes of deception and battle, and have been strengthening for centuries, they will not yield the last great final contest without a desperate struggle, and all the world will be on one side or the other of the question. The Battle of Armageddon will be fought, and that day must find none of us sleeping. Wide awake we must be, as wise virgins, having oil in our vessels with our lamps. The power of the Holy Ghost must be upon us, and the captain of the Lord's host will stand at the head of the angels of heaven to direct the battle. Solemn events before us are yet to transpire. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded. Vial after vial poured out, one after another upon the inhabitants of the earth or inhabitants of the earth. And so we can go on. It says about this scenes of stupendous conflict. So, is this talking about the seven trumpets? Of Rev no, it's not. It's talking about something in the future about war and a battle that's happening. Now, is there a similarity between the seven trumpets and the seven last plagues? And I want to look at that. So I, I didn't have the rest of that quote, sorry, there for you, for you to follow, but you have it in your notes. Okay, similarities between the trumpets and the plagues. So if we look at the trumpets and the plagues, and this is what people are trying to say, the trumpets are just the plagues. And we can see they're both upon the earth, the first one, the, both the next two are upon the sea, the third, are, and you could look these up, the sun smitten, uh, the air's darkened, you know, there's darkness, the great river Euphrates is in the sixth one, the mystery of God is finished is the seventh, it is done, and um, there's also lightnings, voices, thunderings, earthquake, great hail, and that happens there. So we can see there's similarities. Now, when we're going to study the trumpets, we will find that the trumpets are judgments against what? Anybody know? Rome? Pagan Rome. Okay. The plagues, what are the plague, plagues judgments against? Papal Rome, right? Modern Rome, we, oh yeah, modern Rome, pardon me, yes, I knew that wasn't right. So modern Rome, right? And so we can see there's pagan Rome and modern Rome, they both have plagues. The trumpets are plagues, but they are not the seven last plagues. Yes. Does that make sense? So it's fairly simple. Well, now, well that's, ta that's talking about the future. So the trumpet after trumpet there is not talking about the seven trumpets. It's talking about warnings before the plagues. And it doesn't even say that there's seven trumpets. It just says trumpet after trumpet. Warning after warning is going to be sound. A warning or a call to war. And then, then the vial after vial of the plagues will be poured out. Nothing there about seven trumpets. It's just, it's something we just read into the text. And uh, it goes contrary to the plain statements in the spirit of prophecy regarding the fifth trumpet and the end of the second woe as being fulfilled in Millerite history. Because you can't have the trumpets in the future because they're not fulfilled, right? You can't, you can't take... Now there's an application. We can look at the trumpets and we can see how they parallel the plagues and so forth and we can learn some things from parallels. We all know about that. But we have to place the trumpets historically where the Bible places them. Okay, now we can see there's also differences between the trumpets and the plagues. Now they're both, six are symbolic and one is literal. Six are literal, one is symbolic. So we can see they're opposite in that sense. Uh, you know, we have, here we have one third on the left side with the trumpets, one third being smitten and affected. You know, here we have something that's universal, right? So. There's smoke from darkness pit, locust torment, torment for five months, papal kingdom filled with darkness, right? So we can see that these things, here we have in the sixth, the angels loose from the Euphrates, here we have the Euphrates dried up and the evil spirits unite, right? So we have, we have some differences here. And a third of the horsemen are killed, or mirrors of horsemen, a third of men killed. The whole world's against God. So we have some things that are similar and some things that are different. To try to take the trumpets and put them into the future is a very dangerous thing to do. And uh, 
I got these charts from a guy on the internet, the 666man.net. So he has some very good studies there. Um, now this is just Revelation chapter 8, verse 6 to 12, which deals with the first four trumpets. And I could read through this, but I'm not going to. Uh, but we will refer to it so you have your notes. Um, now, when we look at these trumpets, we have the, you know, the first trumpet sounds. And uh, what I will do is I'll go to this here. Well, the question, see, I should have put that in a different order. So, okay, I'm going to go back. How do I go back? That's the problem. Right click? You just right click on your mouse? No, that doesn't do anything. Okay, I'm going to go back here. So, when we look at that, we have the first uh, angel sounds, and we have uh, a series of events. But the main thing I want to see is here is that there's this thing called the third part, right? So we have the third part of the trees was burned up, right? In the second angel sounds, there's a great mountain burning with fire, it was cast in the sea. The third part of the sea became blood. Uh, when the third angel sounds, uh, we see a third part of the rivers and the fountains of waters, right? And uh, in the fourth angel sounds, a third part of the sun smite, and a third part of the moon, a third part of the stars. So this third part is an extremely important uh, point. Uh, now, the way that this is understood within Adventism is a progression of events. So, here's what Uriah Smith says in Daniel and Revelation 473 and 474 regarding the third part. The Roman Empire, after Constantine the Great, was divided into three parts. Hence the frequent remark, a third part of men, is an allusion to the third part of the empire which was under the scourge. This division of the Roman Kingdom was made at the death of Constantine among his three sons, Constantius, Constantine the second, and Constance. Uh, I think he's a little bit into himself there, but uh, <laughs> named the city to Constantinople as well. So Constantius possessed the east and fixed his residence at Constantinople, the metropolis of the empire. Constantine the second held Britain, Gaul, and Spain, and Constance held Illyricum, Africa, and Italy. Okay, so we can see now this is the division of the Roman Empire. And we know that that green part over there is what became, you know, the Western Catholic Roman Empire, right? That became, uh, the Catholic Church had that area. And the other parts became part of uh, the Eastern Churches, the Eastern Catholic Churches, right? So not the Roman Catholics. But this is how it was divided in around uh, 500 AD under Constantine. So I want to look at this and what we see in the trumpets, so I'm not going to go into detail. You have to go over these first four trumpets yourself in a bit more detail. But we see a progressive destruction of Western Rome. And the first trumpet is uh, in Revelation 8 verse 6 to 7. And we, we can look at history that this trumpet was fulfilled in 395 to 410. Okay, so if we put, bring it up here, you can see that there. And it's Alaric, who is the leader of the Goths. And this trumpet, the hail, the fire, the blood, which is the symbol that's being used, shows the destructive nature of that happened against Rome. When we look at the second trumpet, we see Genseric. He was the king of the Vandals, leader of the Vandals. And his territory that he conquered was the sea. Right? So the Mediterranean, that's where he he went and conquered the, the Roman uh, coastal areas. Uh, the third trumpet is Attila, the Hun, and he's symbolized by a great star, and he attacks the rivers. So he's actually up in the, the northern area in the mountains. And there are symbols about earth, sea, and rivers, which I'm not going to go into, but they have a literal and a symbolic nature to them, which is interesting. Uh, but the primary thing is the symbolic 
nature of these uh, these things. So somehow my mouse just disappeared. See, I hate technology. Maybe a whiteboard is better. Yeah, my mouse is completely gone. So there it is. Okay. Yeah, it travels a bit. Okay, oh, we'll go there. Now, here we see this is the Goths. So this is the first attack with Alaric. And we can see that they actually go into Illyricum. Illyricum. And they actually even try doing some, some battles against Constantinople, which isn't shown here. Um, and that's why it says all grass was burnt up, right? But only a third of the trees. So the trees refer to uh, the rulers or the leaders, but the grass refers to the people. But we can see that two-thirds of Rome is affected in this vision, but mostly it's the third of Rome. So the, the main focus of uh, these judgments are against Western Rome. And uh, this is the migration of the Vandals. So you can see that they went through all the sea area. Uh, they ended up taking that northern part of Af Africa. And uh, this is the invasion of the Huns. So uh, with the Huns, they, they were the rivers and the, the fountains of waters. And so they're in the mountains with all the streams and rivers. But also, uh, they're cutting off trade routes and, uh, and breakdown of the communication within the empire. So trade was affected. And then, uh, again, you know, this could be just my battery's not strong enough to, to do this. There it is again. Hey, whoops. And then we have the Heruli. So we can see here, what they do is they're the ones responsible for the fall of Rome itself in 476. And so you can see that their focus is on that boot of Italy, right? So, uh, and in 476, Rome falls. So that is the progressive destruction against Western Rome and part of uh, Central Rome, I guess you might call it. So that's a fairly simple concept. It's not, uh, you know, in trying to do this, I could have just presented the woes without the trumpets, but I wanted to go over that. Now, is there any kind of questions dealing with that? Is everybody really familiar with the trumpets, the first four trumpets? Because I encourage you to study it. There's still more. I mean, there's more I could have brought out, but it would have just uh, been too much. What we need to look at here in, in regard to light. So I'm kind of going back to the beginning where I talked about this unfolding of light. Now this is a statement from A Word to the Little Flock. And this is dealing with the message of the midnight cry. So, of course, that's later than uh, Josiah Litch's prophecy. But this applies to us. They, it says, they had a bright light set up behind them at the first end of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry. This light shone all along the path. And further down, it says, others rashly denied the light behind them and said it was not, of, it was not God that had led them out so far. Now, we've had a lot of discussion regarding this, uh, regarding... Uh, the deceptions that are out there in how we study the Bible. Many people are denying this light. One of the ways I think that we can help others is sometimes the things that we are studying, they seem to us like these are the exciting things. You know, I want to share the, the 25-20 or I want to share the seven thunders. But many people don't even have the basic foundation of the trumpets. And I know, like, Kelly, he, he would share that with people all the time, the trumpets. You know, and show him he has an H.S. Richard study Bible that has the trumpets, Uriah Smith's interpretation of the trumpets, the historic uh, pioneer interpretation of the trumpets. 
And that can sometimes be a way to reach people. Now, we're going to look in, uh, in the rest of my lectures. Yes? Can that have a second application? Yeah, well, history will be repeated. So the, the judgments against pagan Rome have a symbolic representation of the judgments against modern Rome, right? So yes, there is a further application. And uh, the thing that we don't want to do is reject the pioneer understanding of the trumpets and just say the pioneers were wrong. So I'm going to deal a little bit in my next couple of lectures with Heidi Hike's views on what he says. Um, but this, this, this uh, lecture went a lot faster than I thought it was going to go. So I'm going to just kind of drift away from this and then I'm going to come back to it. So I want to just show something here. So this is a completely different topic, but just dealing with what the 2520. So if you can get your mind in a different gear. Some of you may have looked at this. Here we have uh, what Michael referred to, that there's 220 years from Manasseh to, to Artaxerxes' first decree, right? Or third decree. His first decree, but the third decree, right? So these are decrees. Now Manasseh is taken captive, and this is the first seven times, right? It says, I'll break the pride of your power. Manasseh was taken to Babylon by Esarhaddon Hayden in 677 BC. And he, with 21 other kings from Palestine and the seacoast, was forced to haul timbers uh, to Nineveh to work on the, ca the, capital, uh, the, throne, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Babylon was the temporary capital. And Esarhaddon Hayden says, I sent out these 22 kings un to haul timber under difficult conditions. And that's where Manasseh was in affliction. He wasn't in prison in Babylon. He was with 22, 21 other kings, so there's 22 altogether, forced to work as a slave. Okay, And that's in 677. 70 years later, so that's a period of probation. So that means the first seven times is 70 years. Jehoiakim, in his third year, uh, he's besieged. Daniel is taken captive. And this period here begins the Babylonian captivity, which ends with Cyrus's decree. Right? So this period is 70 years. Okay, so that means the second seven times is 70 years. The third seven times is Jehoiachin. Right? And if you read, it's dealing with the siege. I'll besiege you when you're in your cities. And this is the siege that, uh, where Jehoiakim is taken captive, and it's actually the first destruction of Jerusalem. So most people don't know that a destruction of Jerusalem occurred under this siege, which archaeologists can measure, and they can see the difference between this destruction and this one that happened under Zedekiah. So they say there was a destruction, and they can date it. So, uh, so from this destruction, which is 597, the destruction of Jerusalem to the commandment to restore to build Jerusalem is 140 years. Okay, you see that? 457 to 597 is 140 years. These two, this one and this one, are 140 years as well. So you can have back-to-back -back sevens that are 140 years. So 70 years plus 70 years is 140. This is 140 as well. Now you'll see that Cyrus's decree ends the Babylonian captivity. And just like the first angel's message, how it contains the three angels' messages, fear God, give glory to him, and the hour of his judgment has come, Cyrus's decree ends the captivity of the land. It uh, restores, uh, it ends this, um, the civil thing so they can go back to the city of Jerusalem. And it also begins the building of the foundation of the temple. The temple is destroyed in 586. And the temple is rebuilt under Darius's decree 70 years later. So there's 70 years for the destruction and the rebuilding of the temple. Now this is the first seven times. 
this is the second, this is the third. The fourth is a repeat of the verse three. So here the kingship ends, so the pride of the power is broken. Uh, the city is destroyed, just like here. Um, and uh, with Jeho or the city is destroyed like here, and then here uh, the people are also taken into captivity. And between these two decrees is 49 years, or between 586 and the first decree is 49 years. This was actually going to be a jubilee year. This is a jubilee year, right? So they, they could have repented, but when the fourth seven times happens, that's the one that says the captivity is going to be based upon the time that they transgressed, which is 490 years. And so that one seals up the first three seven times are conditional. The fourth, once it occurs, there's no, there's no repenting. And so they have to go their length. And this 220 years of the Babylonian captivity these three decrees are ending the captivity of literal Israel in Leviticus 26. In Great Controversy, Ellen White says that all three decrees are needed to begin the 2300 days. So the same decrees that end the captivity of literal Israel, which is a 220 year period, begin the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. So if you add 220 plus 2300, you get 2520. And in showing people the 2520 this way, uh, it's been very convincing to people. Right? And you can see that, that this is just another way to show the 2520. So God in his design uh, wanted us to understand that there is a connection, one, between the history of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes with the Millerite time period because the three decrees parallel the three angels' messages. But it also shows that this, this period of what we're dealing with in the seven thunders, this period of these kings, is also important. And these four, the number four, which Jeff is going to be talking about, I believe, is extremely important. So we can see four and three. Okay? Now when we look at the trumpets, how do we group the trumpets? Four and three. Four and three right? You can actually even see this in the seven churches. You can see it in a lot of things that God, when he has the number seven, often they're grouped four and three. And so when we look at the first four trumpets, their destructions of, as we, uh, judgments against pagan Rome. The next three trumpets are destructions against Rome as well. The, the fifth and sixth trumpets are destructions or judgments against papal Rome. Okay? And the seventh trumpet is judgments against modern Rome, okay? And, you know, I don't have time, you know, we could look at the structure of the book of Daniel and the structure of the book of Revelation, and we're gonna see that they follow these patterns within in this fractal way, that God has this design that on smaller levels and larger levels of three and four adding up to seven, and four is always a progression of uh, you know, it's a progressive destruction, right? And so there, there's so much to understand in these things. Um, I want you to study them, right? And I'm going to continue studying them. So, I think I'm too well prepared. I go way too quickly. Is there any questions about anything I've said or any comments? Yes, Allison. Okay, so the third of Rome is, is being attacked, and so we said that uh, the first trumpet, it attacks the trees and the green grass, but it attacks only a third part of the trees and all of the green grass, which means it actually affected all of uh, the Roman Empire. So all of Rome was affected by uh, the Goths under Alaric, right? But really only a third part of the, the rulers were affected. So as far as the military structure and the political structure, only Western Rome was affected by the Goths. They did affect the people. They raided people throughout the Roman Empire, uh, Eastern and Western. 
but they only affected the, the military and political structure of Western Rome. Then the second uh, angel, the second trumpet, there's a great mountain burning with fire, it was cast into the sea. So the vandals affected uh, the sea, right? And we could see that in, in the arrows around in the area that they conquered. So they went along the sea coasts and actually had ships and went into the Mediterranean and attacked those areas. And then the third trumpet with Attila, and it says, um, I'm going to read this here. The third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the na So there's different ways we can look at rivers and waters. One is they are people, but they're also routes. So they're trade routes. So uh, if you look at the area where the Huns uh, attacked, it was the trade routes that were, were widely affected. You know, some people have different symbols. There's different ways you could look at uh, the rivers and the waters as well. Um, so some people have different ways they look at it. Odiaser, under the Hurulais, what's affected is the sun, moon, and stars. Now what does the sun, moon, and stars represent? Leaders, right? So we can see that obviously Rome was destroyed, the city of Rome, even though the capital had moved to Ravenna, nonetheless, politically, uh, Rome as a symbol was much more powerful than Ravenna. And uh, that's what was affected. Basically, the political structure was finally removed. Rome no longer had a political structure. Now, I guess you know, part of the thing I missed here, these judgments against Rome, why do they happen? Okay. Okay. Well, they happened because of the Roman Sunday Law in 321. That's a good good answer. Anything else? I mean, I wasn't thinking backwards. I was thinking more forwards. You know, what were they preparing for? The Protestant Reformation. Well, actually, the rise of the papacy, because paganism has to be taken out of the way in order for the papacy to be set up. Okay. Paul talks about that in 2 Thessalonians. So one of the reasons that this truth has been attacked is because it is foundational for understanding the daily. Okay? So when, when we look at the attack that Satan has done upon Adventism, upon the message, I mean, how many of you have came into the Seventh-day Adventist church at a Revelation series? Okay. How many of you at a Revelation series had a presentation on the trumpets? Right? Right? This is foundational Adventism, and it used to be part of our message. If you look at HMS Richard's study Bible, he has the trumpets in it. He thinks it's important that people understand the trumpets. HMS Richard Sr., right? Uh, junior, I don't think he cared, but, uh, you know, obviously at one point in Adventism, the trumpets were important. And the point at which they stopped being important was when? Anybody know when the trumpets were first attacked? When the daily was changed. Exactly. When the daily was changed. Right? So they were connected to the daily. When was that? Well, at the early 1900s. Right? You know, so definitely by the 1919 Bible Conference, they did not believe the pioneer view of the trumpets. There was all kinds of things that were happening before that. One is speculation on, on different things. So new ideas coming in from Protestantism, different influences. And, and people wanted new ideas that weren't an unfolding of the old truths. Right? They wanted new ideas that were new. Right? And so our new, our, our new ideas, new light is an unfolding of old light, right? But that's not what they wanted. They wanted, you know, the doctrine of Christ. They wanted this, they didn't want to be seen as, they wanted to be seen new, relevant, hip, you know, all those kinds of things, so that they could influence the other churches, and especially the theologians, 
They wanted to be recognized by the theologians that they were hobnobbing with. Right? They didn't want to be seen as a cult. They wanted to become a part of a club. And do you want to become a part of a club? I do. You know, I want to be part of God's church. <laughs> but it's based upon a completely different set of principles. What is that one thing that stands in the way for all of us to become a part of Christ's kingdom? Self. Yeah, that cross that we have to bear. Right? Self has to die. And can you crucify yourself? No. no. Somebody else is going to have to crucify you. Right? You can yield up yourself, but self cannot crucify self because it's self. Right? But Jonah, you have a comment. Yeah, I got 10 minutes. Okay, so this understanding of the 2520, this is how I studied it. Okay, so what I did is I looked at Leviticus 26 and I said, what are the events that Leviticus 26 is talking about? And this was two years ago and I presented them at the Sylvan Lake uh, camp meeting and Jeff happened to produce, pre uh, present the same idea and he had found it at the same time I did. So. I thought that was significant. Now I didn't understand everything quite there. Uh, I understood these beginnings. I didn't understand the connections between the endings and the beginnings. But I knew that the events were the breaking of your pri the pride of your power. Now actually the destruction of the temple is also, the temple is also called the pride of your power. Right? So that was destroyed in 586. So in this one is contained these three. Right? Because this is a 3-1 combination. So we have the breaking of the pride of your power. The wild beasts come and rob you of your children. What's the first wild beast? The lion, Babylon, right? That's the Babylonian captivity. Ellen White says that when Osiris acceded to the throne, that marks the completion of the 70 years from when the first Hebrew captives were carried away to Babylon. So we know that Cyrus's decree marks the end of the Babylonian captivity. Jehoiachin, this was one that you know, I didn't know about. I, you know when you read Uncle Arthur's Bible story books you know, to get your theology? What you get is you get these three events all conflated into one. So you think Daniel's taken captive, the city's destroyed, the temple is destroyed, and it all happens in one you know, day. You know, it just all happens at once. Uh, but when you look in history there's this progression that happens. Now this is a period of seven years of probation. Right? The second seven times begins another period of seven years that ends with Cyrus. And these ones say, I will prolong to punish you seven for your sins. That's what the Hebrew says in Leviticus 26. The word prolong comes from the word more, which in Hebrew is Joseph or Yasef. It means to add or prolong or augment. Right? So this period is seven years. And then I will prolong to punish you again 70 years. But the third seven times doesn't say that. It says I will yet punish you seven times for your sins. So I'll say yet prolong your punishment. That word yet in Hebrew is not really translatable into English. But it generally means I'm going to now do something to you while I'm already doing something to you. I'm going to continue doing to you. So between this and this... Now I'm going to put the dates here, but you know, this is 607, there's some debate about that, but uh, between these two events is 10 years, right? So this isn't 70 years between here and here. And then this is 11 years, right? So we get 10 years and 11 years. 10 and 11 plus 49, that equals 70, right? So this one says, I will yet prolong you to punish you seven for your sins. And in this one, it doesn't say yet or more, right? It just says, I will punish you seven times for your sins. This one, and then this one in 34 and 35 is also in 2 Chronicles 33, 11 and 12, I think it is, uh, where it's quoted that the reason the Babylonian captivity is 70 years is because you did not let the land rest. And that 490 years goes from 1097 to 607. 
So that's 490 years that the land did not rest. But it's in the fourth seven times that this is sealed up. So 21 years has already passed. So we have to go 49 years to complete the 70 years, right? Because they already went into captivity here. And of course we saw that Cyrus's decree had to do with returning them to the land, to set up a government, to uh, uh, restore the temple, but they just laid the foundation. And then there's the work of the enemies. So you can actually parallel this with Millerite history and you know, you can deal with the work of the enemies and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And this is the second angel's message. Uh, Zechariah and Haggai prophesy um, regarding this. And he says, Zerubbabel began to lay the foundation here and Zerubbabel's going to finish it. What's the name Zerubbabel mean? Out of, Out of Babylon, right? So this is the second angel's message as well. And here the temple, which was destroyed 70 years earlier, is rebuilt and dedicated. So most Adventists think the temple was built over here because it says in the Bible it was completed according to the decree of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. But Artaxerxes does do some work here at the end because when Ezra writes about that, he's, he's writing about a past history. He knows that the temple was built here under Darius. But there is, a, is also a, a work that Artaxerxes has to do. Ellen White says that each of the decrees was necessary in... Uh, commencing, affirming, and completing this restoration of literal Israel. And that's why these three messages, which end literal Israel, their captivity, also commence a period that's going to then extend to spiritual Israel. And the 70 weeks also, which is 490 years here, goes to 34. This period is important because this is the transition from literal to spiritual Israel. So this is now another probationary period that they're given. And you'll notice that, you know, 490 years is a jubilee cycle times 10. And 70 years is a sabbatical cycle times 10, right? And that's what uh, Leviticus 25 and 26 are dealing with. Sabbatical cycles and jubilee cycles. And so a jubilee cycle of transgression occurs that causes a sabbatical cycle of captivity, right? The rest of the land. And we can see that uh, at the end of this period, Daniel gets a vision regarding the 490 years, which is another period of 490 years. There's also 490 years from the building of this temple and Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was built and dedicated. It was started in 113 BC. It was completed in 106. And and, and the second temple was finished in 516. So this is also 490 years. And there's a period of 70 years probation here with Manasseh's captivity, oops, in 677. So that means this is 420, right, plus 70. So that's 490. And then this one here, there was 70 years that the temple lay in ruin. So this is also, I guess I could have left that there. This is also 420 plus 70. So God has used this, and we know the 70-week prophecy, right? But we're going to understand the 70-week prophecy much better if we understand what happened with literal Israel. Because the 70-week prophecy is a prophecy that deals with the transition from literal Israel to spiritual Israel. So it's an, the question... 420 years from, because this is 490 years from temple to temple. That means there's 420 years from when the te Solomon's temple is built to when it's destroyed. Right? So this is 5, 586. Okay? I guess I should have put that in there. And then there's the 70 years that the temple lay in ruins and then it's rebuilt. Right? So these 490s are really important in understanding what they symbolize because they, well, they're a jubilee cycle, but they, they symbolize uh, uh, a period of captivity and release. You know, there's, there's a hope because that's what the jubilee is about. So they're tied to the 2520. The 2300 days is also based on a jubilee cycle, which I'm not going to show you right now. So these are all, all based upon jubilee and sabbatical cycles. So in Leviticus 26, when it talks about, I will prolong to punish you seven, that's bad Hebrew. 
It doesn't say seven what? So commentators, when they look at the Hebrew, they say, well, that doesn't make good English. You know, let's make it good English. We'll add seven times, right? Or sevenfold, right? But the reality is it's just the number seven. And that means it's a symbol. As a symbol now, it's very different periods of, t of time, right? And it was, Ellen White says that that scattering was par had received a partial fulfillment in the period of the judges, but received a complete fulfillment in the captivity of Israel in Assyria and Judah in Babylon, right? So we know Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 are dealing with the captivity of Israel and Judah, right? Because that's what the symbol is pointing to. Does that help, help, help you understand that? Okay, so tomorrow I'm going to be presenting the, the second, the first and second woes. So I'm going to be presenting the fifth and sixth trumpets. And I'll hopefully pace it a little bit better. But uh, uh, I invite you all now to kneel and uh, let's close this meeting. Dear Father in Heaven, there is uh, much that uh, we all, each of us, need to, to learn, to understand, to study, and sometimes, Lord, we feel overwhelmed uh, with the amount of light that is shining on our past. Our, our eyes become, you know, they get, they hurt because of the, the brightness of the light. And we sometimes shield our eyes and we don't want to focus upon that vision that you are giving us, just like Paul on the road to Damascus. And we know, Lord, that when we're seeing this light, we are seeing Jesus, just as Paul saw Jesus. And uh, we can't kick against the pricks, Lord. We have to follow you no matter how, how much pain uh, there is. We know, Lord, that there's going to be many, many disappointments as we follow you. But we know there will be greater disappointments if we refuse to follow you. We pray, Lord, for our family, our families, our friends, our church members. We know, Lord, that this light that you're giving us should fill us and equip us to spread that light to others, to share it with others, regardless of the consequences to ourselves. And Lord, we ask that each person here can diligently study as if their life depends upon it, because it does. And I ask, Lord, that you can be with, with us through the rest of these meetings today, through this week, and that we can see clearer and more clearer your truths for us, and that we can follow in obedience so that you can, that we can walk in that light along the path so that our feet will not stumble. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.